From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. Ahead today, K-State's Dan O'Brien will spell out what the final approval of the USMCA trade accord will mean for grain exports to those neighboring countries. And he'll talk about new crop marketing decisions in the midst of currently improving grain prices. Then the Dean of the College of Agriculture at K-State, Ernie Minton, will talk about the college's leading initiatives heading into 2020. One of those being facility improvement for agricultural research and teaching at the university. Also today, the coach and members of K-State's crops team will talk about winning the 2019 National Championship, again in recent competition. And later, on Kansas Agricultural Weather, K-State's Mary Knapp. All that straight ahead on Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test, fix, save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. This is Agriculture Today, our Friday edition. Thanks for tuning in once again. The grain markets are front and center, first of all, here with Dan O'Brien standing by, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. And, of course, the headliner this time around, Dan, stems from the news yesterday afternoon that the U.S. House of Representatives had, in fact, passed the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Trade Agreement, USMCA. Now that it's cleared that hurdle, it'll be on to the Senate after the holiday break for its expected ratification and approval there. And as the grain markets go, you say this is a significant development, no question. Well, yes, and this year, especially with... The challenges the U.S. has had with what one would think of as our primary customer in a lot of these grains, particularly soybeans, with uh, China, uh, we're we're all that much more anxious to maintain a free and open flow of of U.S. grains out into export channels. And and when you look at, in particular, Mexico as an export customer, and look at their proportion of U.S. uh, wheat exports overall, the hard red and the other classes, here for this calendar year, you've got about 2 million metric tons of business, of wheat export business uh, for Mexico, and that's up from about 1.4 at the same time a year ago. That, those are shipments. That's not counting forward purchases. And really, the next largest customer for U.S. export sales is the Philippines, about 1.6. So here over about 2.1 for Mexico, 1.6 for the Philippines, Japan also is pretty strong, about a little under 1.4. So here, uh, right to the south of the U.S., with uh, strong export transportation advantages of the U.S. sending wheat there, as opposed to other other places in the globe, we've, you know, we're uh, we're pretty anxious, quite anxious, to preserve that outlet for for U.S. wheat. And, and given that of our usage of wheat. About half of it goes to exports or a little bit more at times. Uh, gosh, to have uh, Mexico on board for that's a great thing. When you look at, at U.S. corn exports, uh, you've got Mexico coming in for this marketing year at about 3.8, 3.9 so far. Actually, that's down a little bit from the previous week. But compared to other customers, if Mexico is taking about 3.8, 3.9 a million metric tons of, of U.S. exports so far this market year. The next closest country is Japan at 1.3. So again, tremendous importance of, uh, of maintaining Mexico as an export customer for U.S. U.S. grains, for U.S. corn as well. Uh, when you look at soybeans, of course, the big customer, even with all the challenges that we've had this year with U.S. and China uh, export uh, discussions. Still, uh, China's number one for this marketing year so far at about 8.3 million metric tons. Uh, Mexico is, is has come in, in second, about 1.4, 1.5. Other countries that are important, Egypt at a little over 1 million metric tons. Uh, you've got Japan at 700,000 uh, metric tons, uh, Taiwan, et cetera, just a number of other countries. So as we clicked off three of our largest exportable U.S. grains, 
Mexico is number one by far in corn, uh, pretty strong number one, uh, with others not too far away in with regard to wheat and for soybeans, uh, of course, China is uh, dominant in that, but the number two, not that far behind them, would be Mexico. So in terms of a trade outlet, gosh, to have a, a U.S., Canada, Mexico trade agreement put together is, is a great thing. Of course, there are all, all manner of, of other provisions that we're concerned about in these markets for, for Canada. The key provision is identified by Secretary Purdue and in, in the information they put out is that Canada agrees to terminate it, what the U.S. has indicated to be a discriminatory wheat grading system. Mm-hmm. That's quite meaningful for the spring wheat country in particular, isn't it? Well, yes, and uh, along that border, we've got transshipments going on, you know, where wheat comes uh, across the border and to U.S. elevators, et cetera. I, when I think of the U.S. and Canada as they compete with each other for, for wheat exports, I think of uh, another trade agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the U.S. was not a part of, you know, decided to step out of, and here, here now with the, by agreeing with Japan uh, to have a, a U.S. Japan trade trade agreement, the U.S. has stepped out from under the penalty that it was beginning to bear by not being in the TPP, i.e. a sizable price discount for uh, countries that were selling to TPP countries, and, uh, you know, 50, 60 cents, et cetera, and Canada was gaining that. The U.S. was, was blocked out of it. Well, now here with the U.S.-Japanese trade agreement that helps to mitigate that situation. The U.S. Uh, Mexico-Canada trade agreement. You've got some positive things happening there. You and I talked last week about the U.S.-China trade agreement. And mm-hmm. There are public announcements, and then there's the waiting for the actual business to occur. <laughs> so uh, it, it is interesting. The last week or so since those announcements had come out, you have seen the grain markets move to the higher side. But I think Nothing, quote, gangbusters yet. I, I think the business will actually have to show up and, and we'll have to see the, the weekly sales come in before we, we really respond strongly. But particularly in the soybean market, there's a lot of anticipation or hope that that will come about. And, and I guess uh, if that were to happen, then this whole issue that we have right now of, of wondering where the grain markets will go after the first of the year will become a little bit more clear if there's more of a free flow of of uh, soybeans and and other crops off U.S. shores, off into China and and elsewhere. So the USMCA is on its way to implementation. But back to what you were just referencing there, Dan, the improvement in grain prices this past week, it, it brings to bear the question, of course, of when should a producer holding 2019 harvested grain pull the trigger on sales? Is this the time, given this bump in the markets of late? I don't doubt that people are considering that, and given the strong basis that we've had in a lot of Kansas elevator locations, especially for corn, uh, uh, somewhat for grain sorghum, uh, and for wheat, uh, you know, when we gain 15, 20, 30 cents for, for these crops on the futures, and that if we maintain the strong basis, then uh, gee whiz, there's an opportunity. It, it just kind of quantify that. If you look at the March corn futures, they were at about 372 or, or thereabouts, here within the last week or so, traded up to about 390 and, and closed uh, yesterday at 386. So, you know, there's a gain there. On wheat futures, hard red again for the March contract, had been down to about 422, 423. That was in uh, late November, early December, closed on December 19th at 460. So, you know, 40 cents, gosh. And uh, for, for soybeans, uh, had been in late November, early December, trading down as low as about 865, 868, something like that, had traded up to about 930, closed yesterday at 924. We hear reports that there has been a fair amount of country movement of grains. And, you know, coming into the end of the year with cash flow issues, tax issues all all in play, I don't doubt that that we have seen a fair movement of cash grain, and which we've been blessed in a lot of in a lot of parts, not all parts, but in a lot of parts of the state. You know, I would not be surprised to see a fair amount of cash grain having having been moved in the last week or so. That the case then should producers follow up with a, a protective strategy in the instance where prices would continue to climb, take a position in the futures or options markets. Well, they could buy the futures. We always are quite hesitant to recommend that because uh, futures can go up and they can go down. So the buying call options in the futures is uh, generally the recommendation we'd have. And at least up front, you've, 
you've identified your maximum loss. <laughs> if, if it goes against you, you know how much you're, that you'd be out of out of pocket as opposed to having just bought the, those futures contracts and then be, be really at risk. Just quickly then, if you look at, uh, say, July corn, if you're going and buying at the money, $4 call option, it, in essence, is just under 20 cents a bushel. So what does that mean? Well, if the alternative you were considering was holding grain in the cash market, well, that's 20 cents would buy you at 4 cents, 4 or 5 cents a bushel a month, about 4 or 5 cents. So if July corn is trading at $4, then you basically have to see movement between now and July or end of June, about when that contract goes off, of about 20 cents. And given the forecasts for next year, uh, and I've just seen some DTN meteorologist Bryce Anderson forecast talking about the possibility of, of wet conditions uh, continuing off in, into the spring and summer again of next year. And gosh, just the specter of that repeating itself I will probably have fairly jumpy markets. You could see 20 cents pretty easily in the July corn market. For wheat, uh, of course, a little, little bit different situation. Uh, if you look at the July 2020 wheat futures and the purchase of a call option there, and they closed yesterday about 476. If you look at a 470 call, it cost you about 35 cents. So for that, you'd have to have a gain of about 35 cents over the 470 to to make money on that on that option, or see a lot of volatility be expressed. And what would that take you to? Well, you'd be over five dollar wheat. Not impossible if we have problems, but uh, probably a little less intuitively appealing than than what we just talked about for July corn making it over 420. Dan, in that we'll be away for the holidays the next couple of weeks. Our next visit will be on the very eve of the release of that USDA Grain Supply and Demand Report on January the 10th. So we'll preview that all-important report when we visit again. Many thanks to you, and happy holidays to you and yours. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Dan O'Brien, Grain Market Economist for K-State Research and Extension, based in Colby, northwest Kansas. Agriculture Today is back. After this, over the K-State Radio Network. Did you eat today? Thank a farmer. A way to get more involved in agriculture is through 4-H and FFA. Through 4-H and FFA, we have been given multiple opportunities to grow as leaders and learn more about agriculture. You can learn skills related to jobs, public speaking skills, and you get the opportunity to travel around the country and meet new people. If you want more information about getting more involved in 4-H and FFA, visit them on their websites at kansasffa.org and kansas4h.org. We're back now on Agriculture Today. If you've been tuned in this week, you'll know that we've been visiting with certain leaders in the K-State College of Agriculture, more or less a year in review of research and extension activities associated with the college here in 2019. Well, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk with the individual who oversees it all. And in fact, earlier this year, the interim part of his title of Dean of Agriculture was taken off. He now holds that post fully. Ernie Minton has joined us. Ernie, your reflections on 2019 as the college's priorities and challenges. How would you summarize that? Well, first of all, Eric, thank you for having me in. I'm happy to be here, and uh, I guess I'd be remiss if I didn't highlight really very fortunate being named the dean and director. Uh, That officially started July 1, and of course I carried forward straight across from uh, interim dean for a year, and so it's a great honor, uh, big responsibility, uh, and uh, I'm I'm pleased to be in that position. So beginning... uh, Back when I became interim dean and, and actually really carrying forward uh, from the, the planning that uh, Dean Floros had done, I was asked early on by the president to uh, come up with a facilities master plan. So it's no surprise to our alums that are out there listening and others who are familiar with the campus that the College of Agriculture uh, has a lot of great buildings, but Many of them need help and are are aging and have quite a bit of deferred maintenance. And we've got that in every one of our buildings and some quite more than than others. And so we've engaged with an on-call architect and and work with them to 
devise a facilities master plan that we hope is is reasonable. It's not a small number, however. I don't want to leave that in question. Uh, It's a challenge, but the answer is, well, it's too big. We can't do anything. We've really got to address that problem. And so we spent the bulk, really, of 2019 trying to get that master plan in order. We've got some great drawings. Uh, We're at the point now where the next step is to look with the K-State Foundation at at what may be feasible from a a private fundraising perspective. And then based on that, we know what we uh, need to go and make the case for from the state. And then there may be even a possibility Uh, based on some language in the farm bill and other kinds of things that perhaps there'll be some federal money that might be available as well. And as far as future bricks and mortar, though, the initial building block has been more or less identified, hasn't it? Yes. We just really had uh, some challenges, in particular in Schellenberger Hall, with uh, some aging mechanical infrastructure and so on. And so we really identified that as uh, the first thing we need to take care of. And we actually have a very uh, well thought out, it's still a work in progress, but thinking in terms of maybe moving the Department of Grain Sciences and Industry into a a new structure that would be in between Call and, and Weber Hall. The idea there being that we can, yes, get the grain science faculty into new digs, but in addition to that, really kind of leverage the natural relationship between the kinds of activities that happen in grain science, both from a teaching and research perspective, with food science, which is mostly in call hall, and then also the connection of the feed science emphasis in grain science with the livestock nutrition side in Weber Hall. So we're pretty excited about that. And you're right, that would be, if we were phasing it and kind of drawing a circle around that uh, set of buildings, that's probably going to be phase one for us. And then the Schellenberger facility would be actually taken out and replaced fully with a new structure for other purposes. That's right. We've had a detailed engineering uh, analysis of that building And uh, it just would be too costly and probably less than desirable to try to renovate that space. And so that's the plan. Uh, That building will need to come down, and we have a new building that's planned in that space. And that would probably be phase two. That building we specifically designed to bring those academic units and other administrative units in the college which don't need heavy laboratory space, so they don't need fume hoods and those kinds of things, which add, obviously, to the expense of construction, but would house uh, other units like agricultural economics, communications and ag ed, and then we would bring over ag academic programs and diversity. Uh, We need a, a new recruiting space for the college Quite often we have families in, they come into Waters Hall, and I in no way want to disrespect what Waters Hall has meant to the college over the years, but we hear parents and grandparents say, oh, you know, it looks just like it did when I was in school here. <laughs> and, and it that, does. <laughs> that's, exactly. That's quaint, but it isn't where uh, what the 18-year-olds want to hear. So that would be the new, the new face, I'd say, for – for families and students as they visit campus and consider agriculture, a, a program in agriculture as a major. The game plan is in place. That's the main right. takeaway for 2019. And the aspiration for 2020 is to build the momentum to make those projects happen. Then. That's right. That's right. So we're going to spend 2020 continuing to get, get our ducks in a row with regard to lining up the story and and making a strong case uh, that that this is an investment that's important for K-State and the college. Very well. One of the true priorities, though, we must mention here for the College of Agriculture, even more broadly for the university as a whole, shoring up the erosion in enrollment. And uh, the College of Agriculture has not been immune to that either. That's correct. And so uh, I think it's it's pretty widely known by, by the audience that, yes, uh, K-State's uh, enrollment has been declining. And 
there are a number of factors that are contributing to that. The one that's cited, I think, most frequently is the data that suggests that Kansas high school graduates in general are coming to four-year or other kinds of uh, post-high school education uh, at lower rates. And so with K-State being the choice for, number one choice for high school graduates from the state, uh, that obviously has an impact on our enrollment. So it's a challenging task to understand what the underlying factors are, but we're committed to you know, doing what we can to turn that around and, and get together a recruiting strategy that will, will help build back some of those uh, majors which have seen pretty dramatic uh, loss of students. It's interesting when we look at the placement data for uh, some of those majors, and I'm citing in particular food science, but also the three uh, bachelor's degrees, for example, from grain science. Ironically, these are the students upon completion of the degree that have a very, very high success rate in terms of placement. I mean, it's essentially 100% placement at very, very uh, high-paying jobs. And so we think there are opportunities there uh, and may, may be a matter of spreading the knowledge of those opportunities to students who would not normally look in a college of agriculture for a major. And that, that would be maybe students from urban settings. Uh, and we have, uh, we have begun to look in, in this direction, uh, been involved with urban FFA chapters, for example, and trying to, to develop a strategy to really tackle that. So prospective students and parents be looking for renewed emphasis on enrollment and recruitment here to Kansas State University's College of Agriculture ahead. One more thing I want to talk over here, Ernie. Generally speaking now, the K-State College of Agriculture's standing nationally for all the challenges that may be, that standing still remains pretty firm. That's right. You know, we, our alumni, have a high regard for K-State and sometimes you want to look at a third-party, non-biased, maybe non-self-serving uh, evaluation of where you stand. Mm-hmm. And there's a, an interesting survey, and any of the listeners can go on niche.com. And if you narrow the search to colleges of agriculture, you'll find K-State is ranked sixth in the country. The interesting thing is as we dug into those data – the perception of graduates about the care with which their advisors and instructors uh, took in their education. There are questions that relate to some of those kinds of things, and quite often K-State was number one in, in those categories. And so in the aggregate, we shook out as, as number six. And so, yes, the college is in, is in great shape. We have some challenges, but we have a lot to build on, too. Well, As we look to 2020, there's plenty to be accomplished yet. So you're eagerly awaiting those opportunities, Ernie? That's true. We really want to make good progress towards addressing that critical infrastructure need, addressing our deferred maintenance issues and so on. Uh, We'll be active in those areas in 2020 for sure. Looking forward to it and to visiting with you in the weeks and months ahead. So thanks for coming over and providing these thoughts. And Merry Christmas. Happy New Year to you and yours. Thank you very much, Eric. And and same to you. Appreciate it. He is the dean of the College of Agriculture at Kansas State University, Ernie Minton. He's been our guest on this part of Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today returns now. Eric Atkinson with you. 
proudly, we can share the news once more that K-State's crops team has finished very high in the national rankings. In fact, another national championship for that team has occurred here in 2019 on the strength of performances at the two main contests which constitute that championship. So we'll meet three of the team members in just a few moments, and we'll talk as well with the team coach, Kevin Donnelly, professor of agronomy at K-State. Congratulations to all of you, and Kevin, folks refer to it as a dynasty. Well, as such, that dynasty continues. Yes, well, thank you, Eric. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. We uh, uh, were once again successful in the competition. Uh, I think our streak now is something like 17 out of 21 years, so uh, and that's not all mine. Dr. Posler ahead of me uh, was responsible for uh, leading the group for a lot of those, uh, but it is a very uh, intensive competition, and so we have a an excellent program here. We have good resources to study, and they have to identify about 325 plants and seeds. Uh, they do a federal grain inspection uh, on eight samples in an hour and a half and do a, a seed purity analysis uh, event that's 10 samples an hour and a half. So it's a pretty grueling event, but uh, we prepare well, and uh, if you prepare well, they're usually uh, rewarded appropriately. Preparation is the secret here to the long standing success of this program and this team. Right. Yes, and I think also we we usually have we have a very strong alternate team. In fact, Madison is our alternate this year, and uh, Nate and Noah were alternates in the previous year, and, and Blake, who's uh, unfortunately wasn't able to be with us, Blake Kirchhoff was our high individual in both contests. So it's a process, and so they they stick with it. They're usually pretty successful. We want to visit with three of the team members, two on the main team and one alternate. Joining us here, Noah Winans. He's from Taconcha, Michigan. Michigan. Also, Nate Dick. He's from Inman, Kansas. Madison Tunnel, as aforementioned, is one of the alternates. She's from Olathe. Let's start with you, Madison. What are you taking away from this experience that will help you in the future? Yeah, so definitely um, time management, commitment to this group. There's been so many hours in the labs over the past two years, and definitely a learning curve that I'll never forget. What was your favorite part of the experience? I think the trips are always the f- are fun. You get to connect with people and make connections outside of your school, and you get to make experiences with your teammates. Nate, how about you? Same questions. Uh, so I would say that uh, when I graduate in May, I'm going into crop consulting, so the plant ID is extremely helpful. And then uh, my favorite part would probably be, again, Doing it the last three years, I've really made some connections with some people from the other schools, so getting to see them every year is always a good time, and yeah, just the opportunity to travel. And Noah, how about you? What will you look back upon fondly as you took part on this team? Uh, So yeah, kind of like Madison and Nate both said, I would say moving forward as a senior going to grad school, um, that time management is everything. Uh, We spend a lot of time in the lab a week, you know, you've got, you're probably in the lab five to six hours a week practicing at minimum. So that's hard on top of classes and work. So it's it's really huge to learn how to manage that time. Also, moving forward, you make tons of connections. Um, this is one of our best opportunities to get to see students from other schools um, and make, make friends that you wouldn't get to meet otherwise. Uh, we also make a lot of memories as a team. Just You're in a van for a long time together, <laughs> so you get to know each other pretty well. Well, we do mention as well one of the other official members that was Blake Kirchhoff. He's from Hardy, Nebraska. He could not be with us today, but he was highly accomplished as well, Kevin. Correct, yeah. He was the the high individual in both contests by a very slim margin over Nate and Noah. So we've had uh, a very good uh, group, and like I said, these these have all been doing it at least two years, and that uh, I guess maybe Nate and Noah actually started a little bit the, three years ago, so it's uh, it's a challenge to make our team and like i've uh, said before it's you know having those alternate contestants we did have three other alternates that uh, were involved in and hopefully that, you know, gets, sets us up good for the future as well. And just for the record, the two contests are what comprise the overall national championship. The one in Kansas City, the one in Chicago, the University of wisconsin Platteville second at both events. Iowa State third in Kansas City and Purdue University took third in Chicago. So it's heady competition is the point, Kevin. Yes, that's uh, certainly uh, those teams have been involved with it for a long time as well. 
this was the 91st year of the competition in Chicago, and so it's been going on for a long time. I'd like to you know, acknowledge the, the support also. Uh, Corteva AgriScience was our lead sponsor in, in Kansas City, and the American Royal does the organization there. And then we had a number of other sponsors uh, that sponsor us. Kansas Crop Improvement here locally is certainly important in supporting our team every year. And then in Kansas City, the CME group, these guys get scholarships, uh, nice scholarships, 2000 for first and $1,500 for first, second, third. So we're pleased to bring home those three awards as well from the CME group in Chicago. So, Excellent. Well, the pressure is off for the three of you as you've continued the string of championships out of Kansas State University and its crops team. So thanks to all of you, and good luck in your futures. Kevin, we appreciate your time as well. Thank you, Eric. With us, Kevin Donnelly, the coach of the K-State crops team, along with team members Noah Winans, Nate Dick, and Madison Tunnel. Again, that team taking the national championship 17 of the past 21 years, including here in 2019, in the competitions that took place at Kansas City and Chicago, respectively. This is Agriculture Today. Next up, this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Here's Marsha Boswell. All Kansas farmers are invited to the Kansas Commodity Classic at the K-State Alumni Center in Manhattan on Friday, January 24th, 2020. Thanks to the generous support of the Kansas Corn, Wheat, Grain Sorghum, and Soybean Associations and our sponsors, registration is free for farmers and friends. John Felt, founder and president of Blue Water Outlook, will provide a weather outlook. Elected officials have been invited to give updates from Washington, including the Senate Ag Committee, a trade outlook, farm bill update, and other pertinent issues affecting Kansas farmers. Dr. Alan Gray, director of the Center for Food and Agricultural Business at Purdue University, will end the day with a presentation on capitalizing on the greatest sustainability story in history. The Kansas Commodity Classic is hosted by the Kansas Corn Growers Association, Kansas Association of Wheat Growers, Kansas Grain Sorghum Producers Association, and Kansas Soybean Association. The January 24th event is free to attend and includes a complimentary breakfast and lunch. However, pre-registration is requested for food count purposes. Visit www.kansascommodityclassic.com to register. For Kansas Wheat, I'm Marsha Boswell. Thanks, Marcia. And this is Agriculture Today. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800 321 322 or visit us online. Welcome back to Agriculture Today. To cap off today's broadcast, climatologist Mary Knapp, K-State Research and Extension, for our weekly glance at the Kansas agricultural weather scene. Mary, catch us up on those snow totals from this past weekend. That moisture was quite welcomed in many quarters of the state. Right. Um, Snow totals varied quite a bit, but everybody saw at least a little bit of it, a tenth to a half an inch in the western areas of the state. Central Kansas, uh, particularly around the Abilene area, was one of the areas that had some of the heavier totals. Highest total that we've seen so far has been just under nine inches. In Manhattan, we had five inches. As you go south and east, uh, there was a little bit of rain ahead of that snow. So we had some places in Johnson County that reported over an inch of liquid out of that system. So again, a nice introduction to winter as far as the snow amounts go. 
it should be noted that as far as the liquid equivalent, all of the divisions averaged at least measurable precipitation, and that's been a while for the western divisions. They still were not particularly wet, generally less than a quarter of what they normally would see. West Central was the lowest. They only had 8% of their normal. That was a, about a hundredth of an inch of liquid equivalent out of it. In contrast, the Central Division fared the best. They averaged 29 hundredths of an inch, but that was one and a third times what they would normally see for the week. East Central was the next in line for that moisture amounts. They averaged 31 hundredths of an inch, but they should see a little bit more than Central Kansas, and that translated to 94% of their normal for the week. So again, welcome. Unfortunately, it didn't reach the hardest hit areas in our drought status where the southwest has got areas in extreme and severe drought, but it should stall that expansion into the central part of the state. So in other words, as you look at this latest drought monitor, no deterioration to speak of, but no improvement either. Exactly. We didn't see any change this week in our drought status. Next week, we might see a little bit of improvement in those areas that saw the most moisture and have the least severe categories of the abnormally dry areas of central Kansas may show some improvement. But we'll really be watching for the system that comes after Christmas, where we've got a fair potential for some above normal precipitation for most of the state. And we will talk more of that. We've had warmer temperatures of late, so is that going to be sustained for a time? We are likely to see that warm weather continue, but when you talk warmer temperatures, it should be noted that it wasn't as warm as you might think. The northwest was about three degrees warmer than they would typically be for the week. The western divisions were, you talk west central and southwest, were just under two degrees warmer. But you move into the central and the eastern, and they were all within a degree of what they normally would be. The north, central, and central, as well as the northeast, were slightly below normal. And the south, central, east, central, and southeast were slightly above normal. Overall, statewide, we averaged just seven-tenths of a degree above normal. Our highest temperature was 63 degrees in southwest Kansas. Actually, there were a number of locations, southwest, south central, and east central, that reached that 63-degree mark. But all of the divisions saw temperatures down into the low teens and single digits. So we had those wide temperature swings that warm up for a day or two, and then you would fall off the cliff with those cold temperatures. Well, then, again, to next week, it does not sound as if a white Christmas is going to be happening. There may be some moisture about, but largely that will be in liquid form. Well, at this point, that's the way the pattern looks. First, um, any of the lingering snow, even those 8-inch drifts that may be out there, are likely to pretty much vanish with the warm temperatures we're expected over the weekend. An example is that we stayed in Manhattan above freezing overnight, and that will dry up those snow banks. So no lingering snow for that white Christmas. Um, when you talk precipitation arriving, it looks like the best chances for moisture don't fall until after Christmas Day. So we're looking at the 26th through um, maybe the 31st for the best chances for moisture. Couple that with the fact that they are calling for temperatures to be warmer than normal. That means, again, as you note, likely that that precipitation will come in the form of rain. When you look at the 8 to 14 day outlook, which carries us through January 2nd, temperatures are forecasted to be above normal across the state, but the 
probabilities decrease as you go further west. And once you get into Colorado and into the western parts of the U.S., they are actually calling for cooler than normal temperatures. So the question will be, how quickly does that front arrive? On the moisture side, very strong tendency for wetter than normal conditions. And we're talking 60% probability. Keep in mind, when you're looking at those outlooks, they take away from the lower end to add to the upper end. So that puts you down to less than a 10% chance of being drier than normal. Hmm. Not that we get a lot, but that is there. It also is worth noting that when you look at the Climate Prediction Center's hazards outlook, they are calling for a slight risk of excessive precipitation in east central and southeastern Kansas. Not that they need it particularly in southeastern Kansas, but if that translates to some significant amounts in central and western Kansas, that would certainly be welcome. Sounds like it may be an interesting finish to the calendar year, but at least very few, if any, travel concerns, at least in this region. At at least in this region, it looks like Christmas Day and the days before and immediately after will be fairly open. Very well. Merry Christmas to you and yours, Mary, and many thanks to you. Thanks, Eric, and a Happy New Year to you and all the listeners. That's Mary Knapp, climatologist with K-State Research and Extension on Kansas agricultural weather, noting that Kansas State University will be closed the next two weeks for the holidays, therefore we'll be away during that stretch. We'll be back with you on Monday, January the 6th. In the meantime, for everybody here at the network, we wish you and yours a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today, over this, the K-State Radio Network.